listen to Professor Davis speak about his passion for literature and the poet Walt Whitman. And for as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated. Um, sorry, I have to start the slideshow. Um, is that up there? Yeah. Um, for as long as I can remember, I have always been fascinated by the humanities. Nowadays, with so much emphasis on science and technology, I would like to explain what the humanities means to me and how reading, writing, and language guided me to believe in my passion to become a writer. On your Snow College website, there's a very good definition for the humanities, which I would like to share with you now in case you have not had to ch the chance to read this recently. The word humanities names a group of disciplines that share one common goal, to understand the human spirit. Humanists study languages and culture, where the scientists gather data. The humanists look for beauty, value, and meaning. When you study and embrace the humanities, you can learn a foreign language, read a novel, write a poem. You can learn how languages shape the culture in which we live. You can be a published author. You could read ancient philosophers and ponder your place in the universe. Thinking and community, communicating are what humanists do best. And I've been fascinated by a particular structure you can find in literature, movies, and also in real life. It's called the hero's journey. So pay attention closely as I go through the stages. of the hero's journey, and maybe you'll see how one stage or more directly tie into your life for any one moment of time. Maybe for those of you who have been on a mission, going on one, or about to graduate, or maybe get your first job, you'll see how these particular stages might tie into your own life. And so I've been fascinated for years um, by an author named Joseph Campbell. And I think some of you have been in the class and have read some of his works. And a book that I, has fascinated me, it's called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And this is how Joseph Campbell defines the hero's journey. A hero ventures forth from the world of a common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from the mystery, from the mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. So during the course of this presentation, I am going to be focusing on um, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. I've always loved Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and how she follows the yellow brick road. And as a runner, most of my life, I trained following the yellow stripe lines of the road. So going back just a little bit, I, I started studying languages, French and Latin in eighth and ninth grade. I started studying classical Greek in 10th grade, and that became my major in college. I thought I was going to teach at the high school level or continue on to get my PhD. But just as you sit here today, thinking about what you might be doing at the next stage of your life, I was there too. And at one moment in time, I decided I was just done. I was done studying classical Greek. And when I graduated from college, I made a big decision to move to New York City with two college friends. They had jobs. I didn't. So that was a little bit of the start of my journey. But we're, I'm going to take you through 10 stages of the hero's journey. Um, and so here, here we are, stage one, the ordinary world. This is where I consider where everything is normal. You think about Dorothy. Sorry, this is not my computer. Okay, here we go. Dorothy is in Kansas. Here she is with her dog, Toto. It's, everything is going normally. She's living on the farm with her aunt and uncle. Much as you were growing up, um, wherever you might be from, elementary school, junior high, high school. And so for me, I'm taking you back to where I grew up in Connecticut. Canton, Connecticut, a town smaller than this town. And I went to a school called Cherry Brook Elementary School. And it was in second grade. My second grade um, teacher was teaching us haiku poetry. We started learning how to write crossword puzzles. And to this day, 45 years later, I still remember Mrs. Perry, my second grade teacher. 
And in this little tiny town where I grew up, we also had a nature center. And my parents would take us there, and we would go on bird walks. I would learn about indigo buntings and scarlet tanagers. I would learn about rock polypody, which is a kind of fern. Um, so I, I also grew up with a grandfather who was a landscape architect and a grandmother who was an ar artist. But on the other side of the hill where I lived was a ski sundown. It is 300 feet elevation. But from the age of 7 to 18, um, I skied. I raced from 8 to 12, and then I ended up teaching here. Um, and so this is stage one, the ordinary world. Then I'm going to take you into stage two of the hero's journey, the call to adventure. So I would say most of my life, elementary school, junior high, college, I moved to New York City for a couple of years, ended up meeting my husband, and we moved to Santa Barbara, California. We ended up having two children. I'm considering that stage one, the ordinary life. But then, about the time my kids were kindergarten and second grade, started having this feeling inside of me. I needed an adventure. And I, one day, I sat at the computer, and as you know from my studies in classical Greek, I've always enjoyed ancient languages and ancient civilizations. And I had this burning desire for no particular reason, but I wanted to go to Machu Picchu in Peru. I had already started running marathons, and this is about 2002. Um, back in 1998, I was actually trying to qualify for the Olympic trials, and my mom was diagnosed with her second primary cancer. And it just put a damper on my desire to um, train that competitively. So my competitive nature from high school, college, um, up until about this time in 2002, kind of done running competitively. And I wanted an adventure, and I found a marathon along the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. And what happens to Dorothy? What's her calling? What changed her course of life? The tornado came, and that was the, the turning point in her life. It's a call to action, something that promotes a change in your life. And it could be a class you take, an email, a conversation with a friend, a parent or a coworker, a professor. You know, there could be just one sentence, one moment in time and somebody changes your thinking. And so it happened to me. This particular adventure, I went by myself, joined a group of runners. Um, we got to travel through parts of Peru. We went to Lima. We met pottery people. We met um, people who wove fabric. And we ran into the Inca five miles into the Inca Trail the night before the marathon. And I had heard there might be snow, exactly what happened to me last night in Park City. Um, we were debating, should I come down last night? And I decided to sleep in my house, left really early because I was worried about the snow. I had that same feeling the night of the Inca Trail Marathon. Um, there were maybe 30 of us. So over the course of 26 miles, we would be spread out. And if you see these stone steps, that's what the marathon looked like. That's what the trail. And then you can see um, the elevation. We had three passes, and the highest was almost 14,000. And that was called the pass of the dead, woman's, the dead woman's pass. But I was sure those stone steps were going to be covered with snow. Um, I would find a partner, run with somebody for a little while. And we ended up not having snow, just like today and ended up finishing the marathon in seven and a half hours. And norm my PR in a marathon when I was training for the Olympic trials was a 256. And I was fine. You know, it was just amazing to have accomplished this adventure. So we go back to the hotel after the marathon. And I'm traveling through the grounds. There are hummingbirds, there are orchids. And I was taking pictures, and I had heard the night, actually the night before the marathon, that this particular hotel had two bears on the property. There's only one bear in all of South America. It's called a spect spectacled bear. And I had hoped to see these bears. And unfortunately, when we got there, it was too late. 
So I'm walking through the hotel grounds, and the, coincidentally, I meet the manager of the hotel, and he said, well, I'd like to take you to see the bears. So he ended up taking me to see the bears, and he ended up giving me a stuffed animal, um, speckled bear, that I took home with me on the airport, on that plane. And on that plane ride home, I had what was kind of a calling. It was, Melissa, write a children's book about the speckled bear. So on the plane, I wrote my first children's book. And this takes us into what I call, well, stage three, refusal of the call. This is when the hero is given the opportunity to accept the call, but at this early stage in the journey, so we're talking about 10 stages, we're only at stage three, the hero refuses to follow and ignores the signs. Out of fear, insecurity, lack of confidence or courage, and so, I just, I would write children's books. And here, here's this, the bear that I got in the pottery I brought back with me. I had Pablito and the speckled bear on my laptop. And another, another children's book I wrote around the same time. My older son had turned eight, and he had gotten a hot air balloon Lego for his birthday. So I quickly Googled, where is the hot air balloon invented? The hot air balloon was first launched by two brothers over the gardens of Versailles in France in 1783. But the kind of cool thing is, what went up in the balloon? A duck, a rooster, and a sheep. I said, that sounds like a good children's book. So I wrote the story, sat on my laptop. Then, another story. I had heard, you know, I was always collecting information, um, always reading. Um, magazines, newspapers, books. Um, I had, when my older son was in fifth grade, I'm not sure here in Utah, but where we were in California in fifth grade, you study American history. So we took our kids to Virginia to see Monticello and Williamsburg, and we had the chance to go to the Outer Banks off the coast of North Carolina to visit these Shackelford horses I had read about in the newspaper. There had been a hurricane called Hurricane Isabel in 2003. I wrote a children's book called Emily and the Shackelford Horses. And Emily had to evacuate with her family from the hurricane, and she was worried about Marilyn, who was pregnant with a foal. Again, this children's book sat on my laptop. And that's what we call the refusal of the call. So it's much easier you know, to stay at home where it's comfortable, not accept life challenges. But I'm here, hopefully, to inspire you as you listen to this, that if you hear a call, if you get at that, those twinges that says, you know, maybe I should follow that, maybe listen to it. So I didn't. I let those manuscripts sit. I did go to conferences. I did send the manuscripts to editors. So along the way, you meet your mentors, stage four. So Dorothy has the good witch. She has Toto to protect her. So when I was living in Santa Barbara, I was involved in a writing group, and this is one of my mentors, Janet Lucy. And we talked about the hero's journey in our weekly writing groups. We talked about the seasons. She would provide writing prompts, and we would have a small group, maybe six to eight people, and we would have the chance to read our literature and it slowly, slowly was starting to build my confidence in my writing. So you look for those mentors. Who are those people who are going to believe in you? So I have my writing. And as I mentioned, since 15 years old, I was a runner. So um, when I did go to college, I did study classical Greek. And I wrote my thesis on the origins of the Olympic Games. I was always fascinated with the Olympics, and I ended up taking a gap year in between high school and college and had the chance to go to Greece. And so in August of 1984, I'm on the island of Corfu, and the Los Angeles Olympics are on TV, and the Women's Marathon. This is Joan Benoit Samuelson, who was the first gold medal winner in the Women's Marathon in 1984. And I just thought, I want to be her. She was my hero. So 
she's always been part of my life. And in 2006, I actually had the she um, hosts a 10K race in Maine. And I had the chance to meet her. And then I just thought I'd show you one, there's one time in my life where I got to cross the tape, but I didn't think you know, to raise my hands like Joan Benoit, but it was still one of the most incredible experiences of my life to have the chance, and especially at the Rose Bowl, and get a bouquet of roses. Um, so another mentor of mine is an author, an environmentalist named Rachel Carson. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with her, but she was a mentor for me more as a parent and as I was raising my children. Um, there's this quote that I lived with that I really, really love, and I wanted to share this with you today. If a child is to keep alive his or her inborn sense of wonder, he needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with him or her the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. So I think it was last fall, um, Rachel Carson was a professor at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute um, in Cape Cod, and there's a statue of her. And it wasn't like Joan Benoit, but I still had this moment where I thought, here I am with my mentor. Um, so then this is one of my favorite stages for you guys to think about. It's crossing the threshold. It's where you hear a calling, you've avoided it, but then you think, well, just maybe, maybe I can make that happen, right? So Dorothy crosses onto the yellow brick road. She starts to meet her allies along here. So it was about this time when I knew my manuscripts were sitting on my laptop. I'm like, I have to do something with them. So where I lived in Santa Barbara, we had a run that was pretty high up, almost in the mountains. And I wish I could explain this well, but there's, there was an iron heart sculpture that I would pass on my runs. And the painting on it would change once, probably once a week. It might be a rose, it might be an oyster, a lily, um, a seagull, um, a hummingbird. And I was always, I have to see what the artist has done. And one time, as I was running along, I stopped and asked somebody on the street, do you know the artist who makes those, those illustrations on that heart sculpture? So I ended up meeting Ben Sacati, and he and I decided, I asked if he would collaborate on Pablito and the Speckled Bear. So we started this idea that we would self-publish the book together. So just remember that at this point, that's the start. It was crossing into this idea that I was going to start making my dream a reality. OK, here we are at stage six, gathering your allies and resources. So who does Dorothy gather? You all know, right? The lion, the scarecrow, and the tin man. So for me, mine were slightly different. It's, Kind of crazy, but I find pennies and coins all the time on my runs, and I pick them all up. So I happen, I do pick up some clean ones, but I have a little tin where I put my kind of dirtier ones, and those are all from runs. And I also, I when I find a penny, not always on a run, I look at it as trust. Trust the universe. Trust that you're in the right place. And then I also pick up feathers. And feathers give me courage. They give me courage to believe in my dreams. And so um, those are two of my allies that I've had for a long, long time, um, 10, 20 years. But I'm also very fortunate. I had a great grandfather who was an Olympic pole vaulter. He was an inventor of the erector set, which you may or may not, almost a precursor to the Lego, and he also published his autobiography. So here he is, Olympic athlete, um, inventor of a children's toy. And it so happens that his daughter, my grandmother, who I call Granny Lou, I grew up with a grandmother who had a children's toy store. So we would be able to go and pick out a doll or a book or a magic trick. 
So I've always had this idea of my legacy. There's A.C. Gilbert, there's Granny Lou with their children's, and they're like, you know, I really love to write children's books. I love it. It's in my DNA. Um, on the other side of my legacy, my mom has had multiple near-death experiences. She's battled two primary cancers. Both of my grandmothers eventually both died with cancer. And I'm battling this idea that I'm going to get cancer. And I would run. I've got to be healthy. I've got to run from cancer. And it was always in the back of my head during these years that I was more prone to get cancer than be a children's book author. So stage seven, the road of trials. And Dorothy with the Wicked Witch of the Rest. So I call this a place where your enemies come, your naysayers, the people who don't want you to make your dream a reality. So this is, as um, Professor Allward mentioned in the introduction, 10 years ago, I lost my house in a wildfire. Um, this, uh, we had lived there 16 years. It was November 13th, 2008, and my older son and I had been on a run that day. We came home, and I'm not sure, well, some of you may know from, I think it was last year, and that feeling, that eeriness in the air, um, it was like that. It just felt like fire. So when we got the call, Melissa, there's a fire. I wasn't surprised, but definitely really scared. Um, I went up on the back of my patio, and I could see the fire coming. I could see the smoke. Um, it was just my son and I, my older son. And we had an hour to evacuate. So I would run around the house picking up. I got two laptops, two hard drives, violin, saxophone, multiple photo albums. And he would pack the car while I went around the house. At the time, we had our dog, and we had two cats. Um, and we happened to find one cat just before we were about to leave. And unfortunately, but she was fine, we had to leave our cat midnight behind. So the next day, 24 hours later, we came home to this. So the pictures on this side are what the next day. And then the ones over there are when we had started to clean up. And um, one thing that you do after a fire, if you know, um, is you sift through remnants to see if there's anything worth salvaging. And you know where the rooms are. And in my older son's room, we happened to find and recover two fully intact piggy banks. So at this point, I hadn't named Lucky Penny. Um, it wasn't even there. But then I had these piggy banks. So the signs were coming. Um, so right at the time of the, oh, so at this time, one thing that I did take, I had a CD of six illustrations from Ben for Pablito and the Speckled Bear. He lost everything in the fire as well. I had the six illustrations. After the fire, a friend came to me, this guy, Andrew Duncan, and he said, if there's anything you could do, what would you do? And immediate re reaction. I'm going to publish Pablito and the Speckled Bear. And Andrew worked with me and Ben for a year. It took us a year to self-publish Pablito and the Speckled Bear. And we did it through iBooks, and it was a hard, it was a hardback copy. We just printed 100, and it ended up costing quite a bit of money. But just to hold that book in my hands, have the newspaper do a review, have a book signing, it was pretty fun. So this is um, about November, December 2009. So I'm not sure if you know, the iPad came out March of 2010. So about three months after I self-published Pablito, the iPad comes out. And I said, this is the answer. I have to publish I, um, iBooks. So I wanted to help other authors do what I had done. I wanted to help them publish. So we created the Lucky Penny Press app, so 2010 to 2011, and these are just some of the children's books. I, I think I have 50 to 70 iBooks we did from 2010 to 2013. We did them in multiple languages. Um, 
the brother of the man who happened to live in Santa Barbara. He did the audio um, for Pablito and the Speckled Bear. We did audio, we did Spanish books, we did French, we have a Chinese book. But what happens? People couldn't find our books. Finding a Lucky Penny Press app, finding our books was like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, what also happened, what we found when we were doing the books, is that if there was a typo, that Apple owned our books. So we couldn't retrieve our customers and give them a new book. So then on November 1st, 2011, um, I launched the website as it is today. So this is still, um, the fire again was November 28, um, 2008. For four years, the boys and I, um, and our, our dog, and our two cats, we did find midnight four days after the fire. We moved eight times in four years. I mean, I seriously thought I was gonna die. It was just all these very unusual circumstances that we had to just keep moving. But in 2012, um, one of my friends um, from Santa Barbara invited me to join her in Park City. I'd never been to Park City in the summer. I'd been once to ski. And she took me, I'm not sure if you've heard, there's a, a trail called the Mid-Mountain Trail. It goes from, it's at 8200, 8400, and it goes from the canyons, Park City, to Deer Valley. I had just arrived from sea level. I hadn't been in altitude. It was gonna be an 18 mile run. And she said, you know, you can drop down at any time. But I ended up at that moment in time falling in love with the trails. I pretty much stopped running on the roads and the trails, the aspens, the animals, they just called to me. So within three days of arriving at Park City, I went online and I found a realtor. And it was exactly the same moment when the last of the fire insurance money had come through. I couldn't afford to buy in California. I couldn't afford to um, rebuild. And I found in the fall, I came back and found a house. So in 2012, I found a house. I moved Lucky Penny. I renamed it Lucky Penny Publication, moved the corporation to Utah, um, renamed it, had the house. But still, things were not necessarily gelling. They weren't coming together. So this is what I call stage eight of the dark forest. So we moved, um, had moved to Park City, didn't know a lot of people. My younger son finished up junior and senior year at Park City High. 2015, I turned 50. Both boys are at college. I call this the empty nest. I still get teary <laughs> thinking about that with the boys leaving, me being alone. And um, my friend said, you have got to run a 50K. So I had done marathons, I'd done half marathons. So two of my friends pulled me to Oregon and they said, you're gonna run a 50K, 31 miles along the Oregon coast. So I did that. It was so much like being in the dark forest. There was wind, there was rain when I was running through. So, I mean, this is kind of what the trails look like. I was sure those trees were gonna fall on me and I was gonna die. Um, so my dad would say to me, what? this is my dad, he would say, why do you do these things? And I kind of said, I don't know, but because I can. So my boys are gone. I started this crazy life adventure. I did a run through one of the world's longest slot canyons. It's here in Utah called Buckskin Gulch. Um, I wonder how you can see that. But anyway, I did that in the fall of 2012. Um, I started rock climbing. I hiked King's Peak. Um, King's Peak is the highest peak in Utah. I started skiing double black diamonds. I started backcountry skiing. I can hear my dad saying, why are you doing this? And the funny thing is, doing these adventures, um, rock climbing, skiing the double blacks, is slowly building courage. It's giving me strength. Um, I was helping other people publish, and you know, just things are still not quite right. 
So my second 50K was on Antelope Island. I'm not sure if you know Antelope Island State Park, which is just north of Salt Lake. I had my boon. This is stage nine of the hero's journey. It's where everything comes together. I'm running, so these 50Ks takes anywhere between six, seven, eight hours. And most of the time, I'm just enjoying the scenery. Um, you might meet up with somebody, chat for a little while. But this is November 2015. 2016 is the 100th anniversary of the national parks. I came up with this idea. I'm going to publish children's books about the national parks, with specifically Utah. Um, and in December, I actually met with a friend who works for the marketing department for the governor's office and said, I have this idea. But then I also thought, hmm, there's probably going to be a little bit of government bureaucracy. I'm going to just do it myself. And so who does Dorothy have along the way? She has her boon. Everything is gelling. Everything is coalescing. She has her courage. She has her heart. She has her brains. And so mine is going back to the pennies. Trust the pennies. Feathers have courage. I had one more symbol that, I was, that was in the back of my head. It's a rainbow. And it was there, but just kind of in the periphery, in the background. And so we'll come to that. But here are the three books, um, the first three in our series. We're now calling the series Wildlife Adventures for Young Readers. We've done three. Um, and coincidentally, the artist for Tiny's Grand Adventure, which is a hummingbird that goes through Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, in the middle of running a 50K in Monument Valley, come up to a woman roughly my age. And I said, you know, how's your life? And she's like, well, things aren't going so well. And I said, what do you do? She's like, I'm an artist. I said, well, I write children's books. You know, would you like to be the artist for my next children's book? And we um, ended up doing this. And here's some of the illustrations from Utah Delicate Arch, Buzzy, Meeting Animals. These are all of the animals. Um, each of the books is geology and animals that you meet in the national parks. The woman I met in Monument Valley, this is number four that we're working on for this year. So then, this past summer, I decided, it's nine hours to South Dakota. There are two national parks in South Dakota. So drive up there have the chance to see the two national parks, see Mount Rushmore. I had the chance to do my first multi-pitched um, rock climbing adventure. And after that, there's a historic hotel in Custer State Park, and I meet a new artist. I didn't actually meet her face to face, but she was an artist in residence at the hotel, and we're now working, this is book five, um, The Secret Life of Phil, it's a black-footed ferret in the Black Hills of South Dakota in Wyoming. So the excitement, as you could tell, keeps going. I meet an artist for number seven. We have something in Park City called the Park City Silly Market. And um, I met this artist who lives in Tooele. And I just love Utah. I love the national parks and just want to be as supportive as I can of how important it is to be in nature, to visit. And I actually starting to like our state parks a little bit more because they're a little less visited. And I've had the chance to go to Bears Ears in Escalante. So this book, will take it will take place Monument Valley, um, Cayenne de Chez, Bears Ears. So, um, I had the chance to go to New Zealand this summer, and that's where another part of my boon, I saw rainbows. Like, look, I mean, it's blue sky, and I'm seeing rainbows. So I've been very curious to put all the colors of the rainbow together. And for me, I had the pennies for trust, the feathers for courage. And I've had many naysayers. People say to me, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? You know, you're never going to make any money. And I started finding I needed a certain person, you know, people who encouraged me, who were kind. And so I looked at the rainbow as what do I want? 
of, for my allies, my mentors. So I look at red as somebody, love and passion. Orange for courage and adventure. Yellow for joy. Green, people who want to be in nature with me. Um, I look at green with integrity, trust. I look at blue for calmness, peace, and serenity. Indigo is where I think of creativity, imagination. And these are personal for me. This is what I've done with the colors. And violet, the highest color of all, intuition, synchronicity, wisdom. So I'm not sure if you all are familiar with the word um, synchronicity, but it's one of my favorite words of all. And when you have, when you trust your intuition, synchronicity happens. Your life flows. So I'm just going to read the definition for, of synchronicity. The simultaneous occurrence of events which appear significantly related, but no discernible connection. Um, I actually just had one this morning with one of the students I met um, whose mother is a second grade teacher and had bought some of my children's books. I have chills thinking about it because it was my second grade teacher who inspired me and it's why I'm on stage right now. And so what did Dorothy have all along? She had her power. She had to just learn it. She had to believe in herself. She had to trust. So for 10 years, I've had this sculpture in my house. It sits there, like, pay attention to this. So the artist from my first two national parks found this plaque in the remnants of the fire. This plaque I got after finishing the marathon along the Inca Trail. I think she was 21 at the time when she made this for me. And, she's, and it, she says, I'm not sure if you can see this, I didn't expect this would make me feel strong. So out of the fire, think good things can happen, right, in the, in the trials and tribulations of life. So as I'm preparing to be here today, Yesterday, I get this letter. Um, I had donated three of the National Park books to a classmate from college who's a principal of a charter school in New York. I get this yesterday, so I, ha I had to include it. So dear Ms. Marstead, thank you for sending your books. I can't wait so I can get my own book from you. And I heard that you're Mr. Headley's friend. I wanted to tell Mr. Headley to tell you more about you because you sound so cool. And just saying, I want to be an artist and a writer like you. And so that was me in second grade. And here, um, a child is writing to me just in that moment of time, and that's stage 10, coming full circle, coming home to your authentic self. So I get to the end of this presentation with this question for you to contemplate. What is your life purpose? You know, and, and as you can see, I stand before you 30 years having graduated from college. So you can see that this journey, um, it can take multiple, you know, it could be a year, it could be five years, it could be 10. And I've had really good things happen, but I've also had lots of tumultuous things. But I just like to read these two quotes. Once you find a passion, it's a matter of lashing on to that dream with complete conviction in unwavering tenacity. And this other quote, I actually had painted on my wall in the bedroom that burned, and I had an artist friend um, do a canvas that's actually hanging in my dining room. So whatever you can do, or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. And then just in closing, um, hopefully you're familiar with the poet Mary Oliver. Um, I just love, love her poetry, and I thought, okay, the summer day, but pay attention to the last two lines of this poem, and she unfortunately just died in January, but I'm going to read her poem. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face, 
Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? And this, tell me what it is you plan to do with your one and precious life. Thank you. Or comments. <laughs> okay, thanks. Running. By, by doing the adventures, by climbing, by doing double block diamonds, by running, it's where, it's really the, um, the ultra marathons where I would just go, and the fact that I could um, climb these multi-pitch, it's like, if I can do that, kind of at my age, then I just, I don't know, it was the outdoor adventures that really helped my courage. Oh, you know what? I just love writing these national park books, so it's endless, you know? Um, but I actually, um, we're driving from here down to Zion. I have a half marathon on Saturday, and in October, I'm running a 55K in Cayenne de Chez, and I'm pretty excited because it's a lottery, and um, they only accept 150 runners because it's in Navajo lands and 800 runners applied, and I was number 66, so I'm really excited. That's my big adventure in October. Oh, oh that's true, yeah. Um, I, I did have a slide that I actually pulled today. I have, I think, 10 bookshelves in my house, and I lost my house 10 years ago, but I seriously lost thousands of books. And on the night of the fire, I took five. And I, I even know which five they were, and I was going to, actually, one of them is uh, the autographed copy of Joan Benoit Samuelson's book, where she wrote to me, Melissa, wishing you good health and happiness for many miles to come. See you on the roads ahead. Um, I had my great-grandfather's autobiography. I had The Secret. I had um, a Jim Hens um, Henson doodle book. And I happened to have my uncle's childhood book. I, I mean, I wish I had it. I mean, it was a dilapidated book, but it was strength and courage. So I, have, I keep them as a pile in case. Uh, I actually live kind of in an area that could be prone to fire in Park City. And so I do kind of keep an eye on where things are, and I have that little pile <laughs> set aside. Yes? I did. Thank you for asking. Um, it, I did. So here's Emily and the Shackleford horses. And that's, it's actually um, Cape Lookout National Seashore, so technically this is part of the National Park Service. We have Pablito and the King's Balloon. So thanks for asking. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Oh.